but today we are talking about spondyloarthritis. Um, so we're going to go through a few different things here. The um, and um, if you guys have questions or anything, send it through the chat or just interrupt me. This isn't a super long presentation, kind of a big overview. So we do want to leave time and, and make room for any questions or um, concerns that anybody has. All right. Let me make sure I can see the chat thing too. Okay. Got you. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about the history. The history taking is huge and, and probably you might have met people who have this condition before and potentially even missed it because it wasn't um, the pattern of what's going on with them wasn't on your radar. So I wanna make sure everyone kind of has this ingrained in their mind as something to think about when they're in their clinics, yeah? Um, you know, it's surprising how little we think about this. Spondyloarthritis, like the whole group of them, we see in about 1% of the general population. So it, it's, it's common, it's out there. If you haven't like found it, you, you might've missed it. So I want everyone to be aware. I um I have a brother who's a physical therapist and he like um you and you'd think a physical therapist would get a decent bit of training in in these types of things and he called me up on Friday and was like I got this 25 year old girl with back pain and she's just not getting better but then she got diagnosed with uveitis do you know anything about how those might fit together and so we were kind of able to like focus that in a little bit more but it's out there and it's a lot more common than you might think. Um, so as kind of a way of reviewing the different symptoms that can be involved, we'll review the history of how it was classified and kind of some of the uh, older fashion thinking about it that, that leads to it being missed in some populations, particularly in women and in African Americans. Um, and after that, we'll go through a few cases of these different conditions specifically to look at, all right? And then lots of pictures of x-rays because that's how you diagnose this stuff and that's fun. All right, so um, the hallmark features of spondyloarthritis are sacroiliitis on x-ray and um, ankylosis of the spine, um, although there's quite a bit of variety as we will talk about. So here on the left, you see a radiograph of the cervical spine and in the front of the spine, we see these tiny, thin, almost you might be tempted to call them bone spurs, but they're not oriented in the direction of the stress on the bone, which would be more of a, uh, a, a horizontal line. They're going down this way. And what that is, is, um, uh, uh, sorry, hang on, let me put that back on. There we go. Google Slides is always seems finickier to me than just PowerPoint. So what happens in this condition is that there's fusion of the anterior spinal ligament. So these are teeny syndesmophytes. So this is kind of a precursor to that bamboo spine you hear about in, um, you know, as the main ac as the main radiographic spine feature when you're in medical school. And here, what we're trying to look at is the sacroiliac joints, right? So this joint here between, um, between the iliac crest and the sacrum. So what you see here is that this is bright white and kind of hazy. There's some spots where the joint actually looks wider because there's erosions into the bone. And there's just this general indistinctness to it. So inflammation in the bone marrow itself, um, pseudo widening of the joint, um, damage to this joint is a hallmark of this disease. So we'll, we'll look at a lot more x-rays and talk about it more. So we've known about ankylosing spondylitis since about the 16th century where they found that patients were developing this back pain and eventually lost range of motion and mobility in their spine. And um, an autopsy study showed uh, the ankylosis of the spine. In the 1930s, right, when we could start radio, getting the radiographs, you could see the sacroiliitis was one of the first things to show up on x-ray. Um, in 1961, the first set of criteria came about, which was the Rome criteria, and those were updated in 1984, the modified New York criteria. 
um, basically each level of these required a certain amount of um, a, a certain appearance on x-rays and the problem with that is you don't find people until they have these changes on x-rays right so here's some of the older criteria um, low back pain and stiffness for greater than three months so we're looking for that chronicity right um, oops I gotta stop clicking on stuff um, the um, limitation of range of motion in the lumbar spine and we have a few specific maneuvers in clinic we do to examine this and actually measure how much the spine moves um, typically not relieved by rest right really important there um, in fact often better with rest so these older criteria required a certain amount of radiologic findings sacroiliitis graded by a, um, a radiologist is graded um, greater than two bilaterally or three or four unilaterally. So it had to be bad enough on an x-ray um, or um, evidence of ankylosis in the spine itself. These are late stage findings in this condition. Our aim is really to find people before they're in this situation. Once you see this, you definitely know what you're working with, but you're gonna miss a lot of people and leave them untreated for quite a while. So um, kind of at the same time that all of this is going on for ankylosing spondylitis, there's these other groups of um, arthritis that have some overlapping features, right? So we know ankylosing spondylitis, that's the classic one with the axial involvement, the spine that gets fused together over time. But then there's these other, these other types of arthritis that can do that, but also do other things. So psoriatic arthritis can involve the spine in a similar way, but it looks a little bit different. And sometimes they have peripheral joint arthritis as well. Similarly in reactive arthritis, there can be sacroiliitis, but there can also be um, uh, peripheral arthritis, often a, uh, often a mono or oligoarticular arthritis. And of course we know the association there with uh, uveitis and uh, urethritis potentially, right? Chlamydia is the most common cause of reactive arthritis um, and also different GI pathogens. So, but that can look in some ways like ankylosing spondylitis. So there, there's this recognized um, correlation here. Similarly, IBD associated arthritis can look like ankylosing spondylitis and indeed they can get sacroiliitis and spine ankylosis, but they get other stuff too. And of course they have IBD. Um, in the 70s, we thought Whipple's disease was part of this too, and Bichette syndrome is part of this as well. There's some overlapping feature there. Um, these top four wind up being associated with HLA B27, at, at least to some degree, not everybody, right? But there's an association there. Whereas these others wound up being uh, having uh, alternative explanations, different HLA association of Bichette syndrome, and generally heavy mucosal involvement, which you don't see in, in the others. I mean, potentially with Crohn's disease, right? But uh, not the same kind of hallmark features there. So there's this evolving understanding of what does it really mean to have a spondyloarthritis? How should we define this? Um, so this is the European uh, spondyloarthritis study group who first coined these kind of undifferentiated spondyloarthritis and peripheral spondyloarthritis. So this was pretty important because this is kind of, you know, what, what I, when a lot of people think of this, they think of ankylosing spondylitis, but that's really just one piece of the bigger spondyloarthritis groups of autoimmune disease. So with, the defin with defining these two kind of other entities, they're recognizing that there were people with ankylosing spondylitis who also had some peripheral symptoms, some less classic symptoms, and acknowledging the relationship between some of those other overlapping disorders like psoriasis, IBD, and uveitis. Um, so this is the uh, ESSG criteria. You got that inflammatory back pain. Um, and then they note the tendency of peripheral ar arthritis to be oligoarticular, meaning just a few joints, um, 
and a little more asymmetric, right? Maybe the right knee, the left ankle, one of the toes on the, on the left or something along those lines and tendency for lower extremity predominance. And you can see this is the first group that kind of incorporated these other things into this diagnosis. So really this is where we are at now. There's the, the folks and the way we think about it, and I think this is useful because it, it kind of helps us decide how to treat it, right? Um, when you have someone you think has a spondyloarthritis, do they have axial symptoms, right? Spine, sacroiliac joints, maybe a little hip shoulder girdle, um, or do they have peripheral um, symptoms? And there's certainly folks in this middle area who have both. And then our conditions like reactive arthritis can involve all kinds of these arthritis. And then there's some people who have weirder stuff out here. IBD associated arthritis can have axial and peripheral. Psoriatic arthritis can have axial and peripheral involvement. Um, and then even within this group of axial, if you remember the old criteria required them to have something on x-ray, but now that we have more and more um, and better MR um, capabilities, we know that there's quite a lot of people who have some evidence of inflammation on MRI that you cannot yet see on the radiograph. So there you get this non-radiographic, and really that's the person we'd like to catch so we can help them before they're just sitting there miserable for years. Right? The average time to diagnosis for these things is between five and 10 years. Um, generally long, longer for women. Right, so let's talk about a patient here. So we've got a 32 year old male, healthy. He's had a gradual onset of lower back pain, specifically with a character of stiffness and aching when he's trying to sleep at night. So not by the end of the day, but while lying down at night trying to sleep, it wakes him up. And then if he's sitting for too long, it, it bothers him as well. You get this story, this classic story of the morning stiffness, right? It takes not just, and now we're all entitled to a little bit of stiff when you very first get up, but this kind of stiffness that really drags on for like an hour or so, um, that is unusual. The improving with exercise specifically, right? Most mechanical back pain will get worse with exercise. Um, and then I, I often don't get this story from folks, at least pre-COVID I did, where you know I'd, I'd finally get loosened up in the morning and then I get in the car to drive to work and then I'm just as bad when I first get out of the car and have to re-loosen up again. I mean, this pattern of symptoms should set off red flags for you for this condition in a young person, right? Lots of people have back pain for lots of reason, but this, this is what we call inflammatory back pain when it has that pattern to it. Um, when you have a young person in particular who is woken up from, who doesn't go to bed with pain in their back, but gets woken up in the middle of the night from back pain, that's like a red flag for this, for this condition here. So um, one question here, stemming from this case is how common is spondyloarthritis? And I told you earlier, when you look at that whole group, including the psoriatic arthritis, the IBD arthritis, it's about 1% of the general population. It's pretty common. That's about the same as rheumatoid arthritis. And then we talked a little bit about this pattern of inflammatory back pain. So keep an eye out for that. That's the most important thing you have to recognize to know what to do next Then, if you need to send them over to us. Um, so what other features would help you diagnose spondyloarthritis in this patient? So let's talk about a few other things. Now here we are up to our most recent um, classification criteria for axial spondyloarthritis specifically. Um, so you're looking for the length of time, the chronicity, right? The age, a younger age, and then um, really even just with back pain and sacroiliitis on imaging, that gets you there. But you can look at these other features as well um, to try to get to the diagnosis, right? So um, an MRI 
If you have active sacroiliitis, if there's bone marrow edema in the lower portions of the sacroiliac joints on MRI, particularly like nice symmetric in a young person with inflammatory back pain, that's all you need, you're there. And that's really the way we make the diagnosis is with the imaging. Um, if they don't have this, if you have enough other things going on, you can still get yourself into this category, right? Um, so we do, we'll talk a little more about HLA-B27. It's got some limited utility, right? It can kind of push you one way or the other in some of these diagnoses, but it's not really a diagnostic test. So it's all in context, right? So here are some of the other features. We have, of course, inflammatory back pain, arthritis and enthesitis, so more peripheral arthritis, right? It's swelling in knuckles and shoulders and knees and elbows. Enthesitis, right? Enthesitis is inflammation in the spots where tendons attach to bone. Um, so common or other ligaments attached to bone. Common problems might be medial or lateral epicondylitis, Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis is very common in, in these folks. Um, all kinds of areas that you could potentially see this. Uveitis, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that specifically, but that can be a feature. So when I see a person, a young person with back pain, I'm always asking about any history of inflammatory eye disease. Um, dactylitis. So dactylitis is swelling of the tendon sheath, right? Um, rather than the joint itself. So it's tenosynovitis of these smaller tendons in the fingers and toes that'll lead to the entire digit looking big and swollen rather than just around the knuckles. Um, that can certainly be a feature, kind of similar to the enthesitis, how we see tenosynovial enhancement and involvement. Psoriasis and even family history of psoriasis is important. Of course, history of um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative, ulcerative colitis. Um, Spondylarthritis tends to respond very nicely to anti-inflammatories, so you, you do want to see that history. They might not get to 100%, oh, I'm perfect if I take some ibuprofen, but you would expect it to at least somewhat respond to NSAIDs. Um, of course, any family history, HLA B7, B27, as you can see, is just one of the criteria here, but it's not a... Um, it's not a strong kind of by itself diagnostic test. And some patients will have an elevated CRP, but most will not in this condition. Right, so um, let's just talk a little bit about the HLA-B27, right? So HLA-B27 as an inherited HLA type is present in um, particularly in Caucasian patients of, of Northern European descent, you know, England, Ireland, Scandinavia, um, Northern Europe, Northeastern Europe, it's about like 5% of the general population there. So there's a lot of people who are HLA-B27 positive without having any medical problem related to that. And it's also possible to get spondylarthritis without being HLA-B27 positive. So it's got some limited utility. If I've got someone who has the evidence of this on imaging already and they're coming to me like that, I don't necessarily check the HLA-B27, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about it in context with other specific manifestations too. Um, so other than this being not as good of a x-ray, can anyone tell me what the difference is between these two x-rays? No. The joint is narrowed. Hmm? There's some joint narrowing on the right side. Yeah, joint narrowing is what you're saying while you're getting the echo. <laughs> Right. So the, the main thing I want you to notice about it is now they're two separate people's x-rays. So yes, they are not, they're not identical for sure. And this, what really you get, do you see how the sacroiliac joints look here, how they're kind of C-shaped and right that, that joint is kind of at an angle. So you get like this overlap, but the joint is kind of narrow or, or the pelvis, the shape of the pelvis here the SI joints are only 
are shorter. And in this, you see how those sacroiliac joints are more linear looking and stretched out. You guys see what I mean? How this is kind of a straighter line. The sacrum looks really stretched out long in there versus this one, the sacrum looks shorter. So this is called a Ferguson view of the pelvis. Um, this is when you're trying to look at someone's sacroiliac joints, this is really the view that you want. Um, this view, it kind of shrinks up the joint together. It, it's not the right angle to really assess the sacroiliac joints. If something's real bad on here, you might see it, but it's much better quality to get this done. Now there's a tendency if someone comes into your clinic and they complain of back pain, because they're going to tell you back pain. They're not going to say my sacroiliac joints hurt. Well, sometimes they do, but not usually, right? Um, there's a tendency for folks to just get some lumbar spine films and then they come to me and we have to go down this whole road. So if you see a young person with inflammatory back pain, what you want is the um, X-ray of the sacroiliac joints. So X-ray um, at Georgetown, it's under uh, X-ray sacrum um, or SI joints, and that'll automatically get you the Ferguson. If you're at the VA, you want to ask for X-rays of the pelvis and specifically write Ferguson views, and they will give you this angled view of the pelvis that more directly lines up with the sacroiliac joints. All right, here's a MRI picture of the joints. So um, what you see here is at the bottom portions of the joints, somewhat favoring the iliac side, there's this edema in the bone marrow. This is the very first thing that shows up on imaging. So a lot of times we'll get the x-rays, but if they haven't had this going on for several years already, the x-rays are probably gonna look fine. Yeah, they haven't had it for long enough to have damage yet. So getting these, this MRI is often something we wind up having to do diagnostically to get these folks to, um, to um, an official diagnosis there. So um, we do have uh, guidelines as far as what to do. So we're gonna go through this basic chart a little bit. These are all updated in 2019 because um, some of our newer biologic agents are making a pretty big difference here. All right, so let's first go to first line therapy. So this is in throughout this, we're really talking a little bit more about axial disease and I will tell you otherwise. So first you have to determine, do they have active symptoms um, and where are their symptoms, right? So if you have axial disease, we're on this first pathway here. First line therapy is um, to place someone on continuous NSAIDs to treat their condition. Um, continuous are recommended over um, intermittent. It just works better for this. Of course, there's many contraindications here to chronic NSAID use. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, but in a lot of our young patients, um, this is an appropriate first step. Physical therapy, keeping physically active, from what your patients have been through, they will know that this is important for them. And we do recommend physical therapy, um, learning stretching maneuvers, range of motion activities. This is a group of people we really don't use steroids in because you really don't have to. They do good on NSAIDs. Um, and now if they have peripheral arthritis, so, so smaller joint involvement, then potentially that um, will respond more to regular DMARD therapy, the kinds of things we might use for like a rheumatoid arthritis. Spondyl arthritis tends to do pretty good with sulfasalazine and methotrexate more so. This down here is saying they recommend against leflunamide, apremilast, thalidomide, and um, pimindronate. We don't really use those in this condition. Every once in a while, I've had somebody on leflunamide and a premolast is more of the psoriatics, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So potentially there's a role here for if the NSAIDs aren't cutting it and they've got some smaller joints involved for using a sulfasalazine or a methotrexate. Um, for the enthesitis folks, similar to, um, similar to the um, axial disease, usually they're going to do fine on NSAIDs. 
There's a lot of places where we can inject glucocorticoids, right? If somebody has an isolated medial epicondylitis, that's, that's um, very easy to inject and kind of locally address the symptoms. Um, you know, high uh, stress tendons, there is a risk of tendon rupture when you inject. So there are some places we don't do that too, like the Achilles patellar tendon. But um, for the most part, first line, NSAIDs is the, is the textbook answer and no, no systemic steroids. All right, so once you have your axial person, they maybe feel, say, 50% better on um, around the clock naproxen, um, but it's upsetting their stomach a bit and they do still have back pain and stiffness. The TNF inhibitors are our next step. So the key here is that for axial disease, the traditional oral DMARDs like methotrexate do not work, right? We go right from the NSAIDs to the TNF inhibitors, right? So the TNF inhibitors, right, those are your Humeras, Enbrils, Simsias, Symphonies. There's a whole bunch of them, right? A whole family worth of them to choose from. And um, how we choose depends on really what's what else is going on with the person? Do they have other manifestations that we need a specific formulation for? Um, if they're female, are they planning pregnancy? Uh, so there's a lot of things to think about in regards to which you would pick. Um, so if they have, and then from there, your next question is if they have a good response to that or not. If they have a partial response to one TNF inhibitor, usually switching to another TNF is reasonable. If they don't respond to initial TNF inhibitor, these are our alternative options now. So here, this group, these are the IL-17 inhibitors. So that's secukinumab or Cosentix and Ixikizumab or TALTS. If you have a television, you might have heard of them because they have lots of commercials. Um, but, you know, it's because they work pretty well. Well, for a while, all we had for this were the TNF inhibitors and, um, and the NSAIDs. So it's really just quite recently that these IL-17 inhibitors have been officially approved for this purpose. And if you don't respond to those, or as an alternative to the IL-17 inhibitors, we also have now tofacitinib or Zeljans, um, which is an oral medicine, which of course people enjoy better than injecting themselves. An oral medicine that it actually shows some efficacy for treating spondyloarthritis. So that is out there as an option now. It's only been a small study with that one so far. And really compared to the 2016 to the 2019, this is brand new on here. So these are guidelines that have changed multiple times in the past 10 years, and we, we keep getting more options, which is great for our patients. Um, right, any questions about that? I know it's a lot of biologic medicine names, but the big thing is the NSAIDs, then the TNF inhibitors, and then potentially IL-17 or JAK inhibitors. We also don't use methotrexate with the TNF inhibitors for spondyloarthritis the way we do in, um, in, um, um, in rheumatoid arthritis because there's really just not data to support that. So yes, therapy, I see the question from Sahil, um, how long is therapy lifelong or is there a window? So, um, you know, it's, it's really a discussion with your patients. Whereas with rheumatoid arthritis, we pursue a really aggressive treatment strategy of treat to target, meaning that if people aren't at low disease activity after three months of a particular medicine, we switch it, even if they have improved because we know we have better outcomes. Spondyloarthritis is a very slow moving beast. These changes that happen, the damage musculoskeletally that occurs happens very slowly over time. And while we have these treatment guidelines, I don't wanna overstate them. Most people don't get to zero disease activity or feeling fine. A lot of people will still have some degree of ongoing symptoms with these medicines and um, 
the data is saying that using biologics uh, or NSAIDs for that matter actually slows the progression of the radiographic damage is pretty low. Like we're, we're really, you're mostly treating a patient's symptoms with these. The disease itself can continue to chug on and the TNF inhibitors aren't, whereas in rheumatoid arthritis, we can prevent most of the damage that people used to suffer. In this disease, we're doing that much less. It's really about getting them functional. Um, so when we're deciding for a person, do we keep you on therapy forever or do we not? Um, that's a big part of the conversation is that, well, you know, if, if you feel like you can manage your symptoms without a biologic, it's not unreasonable. I don't have to tell people like the damage is going to go crazy if you're not on these medicines the way I do in rheumatoid patients. Um, guideline wise, they do recommend kind of indefinite therapy. We knew, we do know that this is a chronic lifelong condition um, and it's unlikely to go away. For patients who do go into remission, we do sometimes try to cut back on medicine, but even after being um, in remission for years on medicine, you can, you can cut back and symptoms will come right back often. Um, so it kind of depends on where the patient is at. I have a lot of people who just like don't want to be on a medicine, and if they feel like they can manage this, we follow their imaging over time. You know, that's not what the guidelines say to do, but I don't worry about them the same way I worry about people with more aggressive autoimmune diseases that are more likely to cause multiple system damage, you know. All right, so let's see. So let's talk about a few other types of spondyloarthritis here. Um, so this is a real patient of mine. She's 32 year old um, female. She came in with swelling just isolated to the right third DIP and the left second PIP joint. Um, she works as a police officer and figures, you know, when she was out, maybe she jammed, maybe she did something she didn't realize, but it just hasn't been getting better. So she finally came to a rheumatologist. Um, when I kind of probed her more, it turned out she had had this like inflammation that came in the Achilles tendon. And similarly, she thought she must have strained it somehow, but couldn't recall any specific injury. So here's a nice little picture of enthesitis. These aren't her real ankles, but you see how this um, Achilles tendon insertion looks like you can kind of see the nice border there, little callus from a shoe or whatever, but the it looks very different from this one, where's this huge inflammation around that insertion site. Now, this is a pretty dramatic picture, but you really only get a good look at these tendons here, like, like this, if you have somebody stand up with their shoes off and look at them from behind. So it, it gets missed more often than, than you might think. Um, and this is an ultrasound picture of the Achilles and tendon where it inserts on the calcaneus. And this is a useful thing we do in clinic a lot when swelling is typically a lot more subtle. Put the ultrasound on it and look and see, do you see this increased power Doppler signal, increased blood flow into the tendon itself? Um, so that's a useful thing that we can do in clinic to look at it. All right, there's just a little structural. This is what a normal Achilles tendon would look like. It doesn't look like the Doppler is on, on this picture, but you can also see here, there's some darkening of parts of the tendon and that, that's a tendinopathy, right? If there's damage to the normal structure of it. So some peripheral features of spondyloarthritis. Now about half of folks with traditional ankylosing spondylitis will have some degree of hip and shoulder involvement. Um, but uh, less commonly, there will be some smaller joints as well, more kind of traditional rheumatoid type joints, but it tends to be fewer and a little less symmetric, right? Like in our patient, there was one knuckle on the one side, one on the other side, rather than kind of being across all of the joints. Enthesitis is common chest wall involvement. And this is something that I've, I, I have absolutely found. I have a few people with isolated chest wall involvement of their spondyloarthritis. So something to think about if you've got a young person with 
chest pain that just like won't go away. Um, so there can be involvement of the costovertebral joints, the costosternal joints. I have one psoriatic guy that's got this erosive arthritis in the manubrio sternal joint, pretty unusual, but we see it. Um, peripheral joint involvement is more common in kids that get spondyloarthritis, and it's more common in women. Um, so a lot of times, women who showed up with kind of inflammatory-ish pattern back pain and a few of these other things, um, particularly if there's chest pain, it, it, it often would get blamed on, on fibromyalgia. And, and, and the time to diagnosis for this for women was much less because of a misconception that it's a male predominant disease. And it's really probably more 50-50 men to women. Um, in general, when there's a lot of extra articular involvement, that indicates more aggressive disease. These are the folks that tend to have higher CRPs. So treatment for peripheral spondyloarthritis, we mentioned the NSAIDs, but you also have the option of methotrexate or sulfasalazine, depending on, um, you know, where the patient is at, what, um, where they are in life, what they um, what their priorities are, right? Methotrexate, of course, for my young women is not always the best choice if they're planning on a, starting a family in the next few years. Um, but sulfasalazine at the same time, while it's a less strong immune spread, it's like these big old chunky pills and you need three of them twice a day. So it's, it's, it can be a, a lot and it upsets a lot of people's stomachs. So you do have those options though for oral medicine. They're not gonna help their back, but if they have isolated peripheral involvement, they're good choices. We also do use the TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors and JAK inhibitors for, um, for peripheral disease as well. And of course, physical therapy, exercise, and not smoking. Not smoking is huge for autoimmune disease and many other things, of course. All right. So let's talk about uveitis. A uh, 36 year old male with history of hypertension comes in for evaluation, um, sent from his ophthalmologist for recurrent anterior uveitis of the left eye. Two years ago, he had an attack, flared up, self-limited. He needed Predforte eye drops, which is the topical prednisolone, but then it, it resolved. He was able to wean off of those after a few weeks. Um, but over the past nine months, he's now had recurrent episodes and has required even courses of oral steroids to control the inflammation. Um, he and he um, still has active inflammation after being on prednisone for 60 milligrams daily. And this is the kind of patient that we get sent relatively often from the ophthalmology clinic when they, um, when they have recurrent issues and they can't get it under control, even if there's nothing else on review of systems going on. So uveitis, right, the uvea is your layer of the eye that involves the iris, the ciliary body, and in the back, the choroid. Um, right, as, compo as compared to the sclera, which would cause scleritis if there was inflammation there or, or a retinal issue, right? We're talking about the middle layer here. Um, so you'll hear people say anterior uveitis implying to the iris or the ciliary body. Sometimes they'll call that iritis. Um, really, it's the same type of thing, just different descriptive terms for depending on where it is. Um, so it's... Um, pretty common if if an ankylosing spondylitis patient is going to get uveitis the odds are that they're going to be hla b27 positive um, and it's about half of patients not quite half of patients with ankylosing spondylitis will have some eye inflammation so definitely something you want to ask about on your review of systems and something you want to keep an eye out for it can be the very first thing that shows up Right, so they can have this history of these this eye inflammatory episodes that go on for a while before they start developing arthritis. Um, you do see uveitis and other types of spondyloarthritis, but not as common as like the traditional um, ankylosing spondylitis. Then reactive arthritis, about fifty percent will have uveitis. Um, I know we we're taught that classic triad of uveitis, arthritis, and urethritis, but it's really only about 50%. Um, that one, that uveitis can be really aggressive associated with that though. 
Uh, psoriatic arthritis is possible, but pretty uncommon. Most folks with psoriatic arthritis will not have uveitis as part of it, only about 20%. So there's lots of stuff that can cause um, recurrent uveitis. If you have a patient who has recurrent like, unilateral anterior uveitis, about half of them are gonna wind up having uh, spondyloarthritis, right? But especially when it's a single episode, the list of what it could be is pretty long, right? We even see in JIA, right, that's pretty common for, for kiddos to get uveitis as part of their JIA, even if they don't have like a spondyloarthritis phenotype. Um, Wegener's can cause a uveitis. Sarcoid can cause a uveitis. Most folks with Bichette's will deal with uveitis at some point. And there's a bunch of infection type things as well. Um, it's when it becomes recurrent and refractory that really people think to send them to us. Um, but a lot of the ophthalmologists will know and will check a, an HLA B27 as part of their initial workup too. All right, so treatment depends on what else is going on. If there's no axial disease, you have kind of a lot of options. A lot of the non-biologic DMARDs do work pretty well for uveitis. The, the methotrex, methotrexates, I mean, in some patients, you have a lot of options for what you can use. Methotrexates usually my go-to. Um, steroids, of course, for bridging are important because if you don't get the inflammation under control quickly, it can cause permanent damage to their vision. So usually this is a situation where we're using pretty high dose steroids to bridge the methotrexate. Um, if there is axial disease or if they're refractory to the oral agents, we do put them on TNF inhibitors, which um, work quite well for uh, uveitis. The best ones are um, adalimumab and infliximab, so Humira and Remicade. Uh, a tanner set structurally doesn't get good eye penetration, so you do need to think about which one you would choose. Um, but all of these work pretty good for the eye. All right, so let's talk about this guy. Um, so an obese 26-year-old male with prediabetes comes for a second opinion regarding a recent diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. He develops welling and tenderness in the wrist as well as MCPs, PIPs, and DIPs about six months ago. The x-rays looked good other than some soft tissue swelling, so no, no damage visible on the x-ray at this point. Um, on his labs, he's got normal sed rate and CRP has a negative rheumatoid factor and a weakly positive CCP antibody, just barely positive. And then um, on this picture here, we note some swelling, right? DIP joint here, DIP joint here, here. And let's see, pretty good through here, maybe a little bit in the IP joint here and some nail changes as well, it looks like, right? You see that white part of the nail there? Look like the nail is kind of lifting off of the nail bed at the end, right? Here, here, some thickened, some dystrophic looking nails, right? See how the end of that nail is different from this one? All right, so um, upon questioning, episode of dactylitis in the right third toe that lasted about three weeks before resolving. Now this, you have to be careful how you ask it. A lot of people, if you say, have you ever had a swollen toe? Like everyone's gonna tell you yes. So we need to be real specific about it. And sometimes people even take pictures of stuff like that on their phone, which is useful. Um, you get a family history of psoriasis and mom and sis both have. Um, and then he notes that trouble with na the nails that we mentioned. He's been told it's nail fungus before. Let's get a little closer look. So you see that fusiform swelling right around the DIP. You see these thickened, yucky looking nails with some lift off, right? It's becoming unattached from the nail bed. Some little white dots on the nails. If you could feel that, that's a little pit in the nail. And all those are features of psoriatic nail disease. Psoriasis is a really strongly genetic disorder, right? Like a, 
it, it, do, it tends to run pretty strongly in families, although the distribution and, and where it involves and what it looks like is pretty different from one person to the next. Um, so this gentleman has psoriatic arthritis and there's several subtypes of this. Psoriatic arthritis can look a lot of different ways. Some folks will get this DIP joint predominant arthritis, right, involving these little guys out here. And that's important because rheumatoid arthritis spares these joints, right? If someone's got pain and swelling knees, it's not rheumatoid arthritis, but psoriatic arthritis can do that. And those can be asymmetric, right? Those can be involving just one or two joints. Those can be involving all of the DIP joints, and that can be pretty destructive. Um, some of them will just get a oligoarthritis, meaning a few joints involved. That's a bit asymmetric, right? Like this knuckle on this hand, this knuckle on this hand, an ankle on one side, a knee on the other side, that kind of pattern. Um, you can have folks that have a very symmetric polyarthritis that for all the world you would think is rheumatoid arthritis when it comes in. Um, and often they are diagnosed as seronegative rheumatoids before they one day show up with psoriasis or something like that. Um, not everyone with psoriasis, but some can develop axial disease, and usually those are your B27 positive folks. Um, and then in its most aggressive form, psoriatic arthritis can present as arthritis mutilans, and which is like the kind of pencil and cup and, and that type of thing. So we'll look at some more of that, those. Now, uh, one thing to think about is that the joint diseases do precede skin disease in a pretty significant proportion of the cases. So if it looks kind of rheumatoidy, but it's a little asymmetric and they don't have, and they got a family history of psoriasis, I mean, this psoriatic arthritis goes to the top of my list. Um, for diagnostic criteria wise, the Caspar criteria, having a, fam a first degree family member with a history of psoriasis is actually on the list of things you need to think about in relation to this. Um, tenosynovitis is very common in this, dactylitis is very common, and enthesitis is very common as well. Now about a third, 25% uh, to a third of folks with psoriasis will have some degree of psoriatic arthritis. And there's a huge spectrum here of how much of a problem this is or, it, or a relatively minor problem. All right, so here's that CASPAR criteria. So as you see, family history of psoriasis, like true psoriasis, or a personal history of psoriasis in the past are actually weighted the same. This is pretty significant. Now you got to be careful, right? A lot of patients like with some dandruff think that it might be psoriasis or something like that. So you're talking about true and true psoriasis confirmed by a doctor who knows what psoriasis is, not just like, oh, my scalp gets flaky sometimes. Um, the nail disease is pretty important, right? So recognizing those changes is important. Uh, negative rheumatoid factor, right? It's typical of this disease. You wouldn't expect a rheumatoid factor. Um, Dactylitis, as I said, is common. And this radio, we'll show, look at some x rays of this. But one unique thing that psoriatic arthritis does radiographically is cause bone spurs. So, rheumatoid, right, eats into bone. It doesn't cause bone spurs, right? Osteoarthritis, right, a degenerative rubbing process mechanically will cause bone spurs. But um, psoriatic arthritis can cause this like heterotopic bone formation around the area of the inflammation, which is kind of a unique thing. And you, you don't always get to see it on x-ray, but when you do, it's got a particular pattern. Um, the type of thing like our radiologists who do musculoskeletal stuff would recognize, but sometimes gets missed and gets blamed on, uh, oh, it's just osteoarthritis. So you have to really look at the whole picture. All right, so this um, radiograph on the right is a normal hand. And then over here is a one image of what psoriatic arthritis could look like. So as you can see, there's several joints here that look pretty, pretty darn good, right? Like this is maybe a little narrow there, but the wrist looks good. These joints look good. Really nobody's CMC joint here looks this good. Everyone's got a little osteoarthritis in there, usually just from life. But around here, these look pretty good. But then you get to this one and there's quite a lot of destruction, right? This is like starting to try to be a pencil and cup with how this has been narrowed down. 
And then you can see there's these little bone spurs of heterotopic bone formation. Oh, let me go back. Um, and then you see these erosive changes in conjunction with the bone spurs. So it's not just osteoarthritis causing bone spurs. There's been bone eaten away as well. And then up here, similar kind of thing. A lot of erosions throughout. You can see that um, there's a deformity here because of this damage. But it's not just because there's bone spurs. This bone has been eaten away a bit too. Right? And you can tell this is, this is not like a polyarticular picture. This is one random joint here. You can see all that soft tissue swelling. See all that soft tissue swelling. But that's a pretty typical x-ray of a psoriatic arthritis, but it's going to take a long time for this stuff to actually show up. So a normal x-ray doesn't rule out. Here's a picture of an MRI of a sacroiliac joint. So as we said, a lot of psoriatic arthritis patients do get axial disease. One kind of unique thing about psoriatic arthritis as compared to traditional spondyloarthritis is that this tends to be a little more asymmetric, right? So here on the iliac side, we see a lot of bone marrow edema. It's not the uh, best quality image, but perhaps there's some erosions along the iliac side here. Um, and, and this side doesn't look too bad. There's a little vacuum phenomenon up here, but usually that's a mechanical thing. Um, but this doesn't look too bad down here. It's more angry on this side. So that's kind of unique to psoriatic arthritis. And the, the spine can be the same way where you see syndesmophytes on the one side and not on the other, a little bit kind of asymmetric look to it. This is a picture of arthritis mutilans. So what happens here is essentially they've got these pencil and cup deformities such that the, the digit collapses down on itself and it has this telescoping, um, this telescoping kind of effect where it's like the finger gets pushed down and this is a, a really deforming and there's very little you can do. I mean, there's nothing you can do to go backwards from this surgically. Sometimes if it's causing people a lot of pain, they'll try to, um, you know, s replace some of these joints, but by the time someone gets like this, they've really lost a lot of function of their hand that they're not gonna get back. But note again, note the nail disease in this patient here. There's a little polish on, but you can see how there's some lift off, probably some lift off here. Um, and note how it, like this finger is, looks relatively normal and this one looks good, but this one is destroyed. That kind of mixed pattern is pretty typical of psoriatic arthritis as compared to rheumatoid where everything would kind of tend to go together. And here is um, an x-ray of somebody more with aggressive arthritis mutilans. So you can see, um, do you see here how like the uh, head of the metacarpal bone is overlapping with the proximal phalanx, right? So this is like the, it's subluxed together, right? This is like dropped down underneath. So this is a really deformed, you lose, it, it kind of, you can see it good here too, how that, that proximal phalanx is, has, is just completely out of alignment with the metacarpal bone. And obviously when that's like that, your, your mechanics of your hand don't work properly anymore. Your tendons are not pulling the right way on the right places and you lose a ton of function. Not to mention, as you can see, this is probably a quite painful thing. And the other neat thing that you can kind of see, you can look at this joint here. That's not really collapsed in on itself, but this joint is actually ankylosed. So that's something you see with psoriatic arthritis too, like the same kind of stuff you might see in their spine, but happening to the digits. This is very particular in the fingers like this to psoriatic arthritis. Um, she, this person is actually ankylosed in their wrist as well. We see that in a few different diseases. We can see that in Stills disease, um, in juvenile arthritis, it'll tend to cause ankylosis at the wrist. Um, as you can see, this, I mean, this wrist doesn't move. These, most of these fingers don't move um, either physically because they're ankylosed or the, the structurally the person's not able to actively move them this way. Yeah, so some pretty crazy stuff. Psoriatic arthritis makes some of the coolest x-rays in a not very good way.
So this is um, uh, one of my mentors would call call these kind of fingers that collapse in on themselves like that, the, hour, uh, the opera glass sign, which of course all of us were like, what's an opera glass? It's like a telescopy thing, I guess, so you can look at the people in the opera or some, some kind of thing. Anyways, all right, so another patient here for you. <laughs> Let me see how much time we have. All right, just a minute. Let me push through this real quick. Um, so we have a 42-year-old male. This is a real patient of mine. He had a liver transplant, came to the hospital with fever, chills, diarrhea, diagnosed with salmonella, got his IV antibiotics, but then shortly thereafter, he's still in the hospital, kind of getting a few other things and placement stuff sorted out, and then develops a swollen left elbow. I figure it's gout. He doesn't get better on colchicine. We come and tap it, and there's lots of white blood cells, like almost enough that you're starting to get scared it's a septic joint, but not, not quite as much as you usually see in a septic joint. Um, so 90,000 white cells, quite a lot. Gram stands negative, thankfully. Um, no crystals either. Gout crystals are pretty easy to find, so when you don't see it, that's um, it's probably not gout. So then a few days later, his right knee does the same thing. Arthrocentesis looks almost identical cultures are all negative at the end of the day. All right, so this is reactive arthritis. We don't say Reiter syndrome anymore, right? Because Reiter was a Nazi. So we say reactive arthritis. Um, so your criteria here, right, are mainly this. Lower limb tends to like the knees, the ankles, can be a monoarthritis. Sometimes there's two or three joints and it tends to be pretty asymmetric. Um, Often you get a nice textbook story of a preceding infection, but not always. Sometimes the trigger is a lot less clear and you wind up calling it reactive arthritis just pattern wise. Um, the most common um, trigger is chlamydia and then otherwise you have like a salmonella, campylobacter, yersinia and some of the kind of more unusual GI infections. It has been described after C. diff and if you look for case reports, there's case reports of reactive arthritis for after all kinds of infections. So um, just because the infection is not the most typical, you don't want to totally rule it out. Um, all right, so treatment of this. Uh, one good thing about reactive arthritis is it usually is a monophasic illness. If it's mild, you can even treat with like a joint injection and some NSAIDs, and sometimes that'll do it. Some folks with poly polyarticular stuff, you wind up needing steroids and that will have a tendency to come back more. Now there has been some documented like, oh, you can pick up small amounts of the bacteria itself in the, in the joint. Is there a role for antibiotics here? Um, that's kind of a debated thing. Now for folks who don't get better with like a tapering course of NSAIDs or a tapering course of steroids, we do sometimes use similar to what we would use in, in regular spondyloarthritis, methotrexate, sulfasalazine, certainly TNF inhibitors if there's axial involvement or if their symptoms are refractory. Uh, reactive arthritis is usually pretty easy to treat. It's pretty exquisitely sensitive to TNF inhibitors to the point that if they don't get better like immediately, you probably have the wrong diagnosis. Um, yeah, for most people, it's ever it's a they're recovering in six months. There's potential for flare-ups in the future, but not to the extent that we keep people on medication chronically for this. All right, um, questions about any of that? All right, let me just show you some X-rays. So here, this is not a properly done Ferguson view of the pelvis because you can see on a Ferguson view, the sacroiliac joint should take up the entire like inner pelvic rim kind of area. So, but you can see from here, there's bilateral sacroiliitis. The bone marrow is very bright and white here. There's some widening of the joint from erosive damage in here. So that's some, um, just another picture of sacroiliitis. The other thing you can kind of see on here um, is what's called a dagger sign. So where there's fusion of these together in the back of those spinous processes. So like here, here, 
normally those are distinct kind of by themselves. Um, and then you would look in these areas here on the AP views to see if there were any syndesmophytes and kind of hard to see down here, but nothing else there. So that's just a picture of some nice bilateral sacroiliitis. Um, the eventual end stage of ankylosing spondylitis is that things ankylose, meaning they fuse together. So in this view of the pelvis, again, not a Ferguson view, so not the one you should order, but you can see, you can't see the joints at all. They've completely fused together. This is kind of an end stage feature of the disease, right? Just, they're just gone. Honestly, a lot of times they hurt people a bit less when they're fused together, although you sacrifice quite a bit in range of motion. The um, pubic symphysis can be involved, so I just would point out there is a nice chunky erosion right here on the pubic symphysis. Right. Cat scans, right? So many people have cat scans of their abdomen and pelvis. A cat scan is wonderful for looking at bones, right? It's like getting a thousand x-rays. Um, if you, and they don't, you know, if, you, if it's done for, to look at their lungs or to look at their belly, they don't always comment on the bones or, you know, the quick text standard, like bones are fine or whatever is in there. But if you go back and look, sometimes there's subtle stuff you find. So whenever I have someone who's coming to me for back pain, I always go through all their old imaging and see if they have a CAT scan of their abdomen and pelvis. Beautiful way to look at the sacroiliac joints. Here we see a um, CAT scan of the spine, which shows some, right, some ankylosis here. So a nice thin fusion of the anterior spinal ligament all the way up and down. Some areas skipped in between. And um, the cuts of where I, uh, of where this is, is not quite right to see, but it looks like there might be some fusion of the facet joints too. So that would be something you could scroll through and see. So don't forget to look at your CAT scans. Um, on the right here is a normal cervical spine film. Here we have fusion anteriorly of the cervical spine, posteriorly and along the facet joints, right? You lose that space in between them here, they've started to fuse together. So though that's kind of like a pretty advanced uh, thing that you can see, right? You don't see these nice facet joints, fusing anterior and posteriorly. Now this is something different, right? So this is fused, but it looks kind of different, right? First of all, this is like super fused and there's nothing going on in the back part. I mean, a little arthritis, right? But this is a mimicking condition, right? This big, thick fusion. This is the, um, this is called DISH or diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. It's pretty common in folks with aggressive um, osteoarthritis and in folks with diabetes. So sometimes when you're looking at imaging, you'll see this where it's like this real, instead of that thin, fine fusion, it's like this big, thick, chunky stuff. And sure, this person's neck is gonna feel stiff, but that that's not gonna respond to um, NSAIDs or TNF inhibitors or anything. This is more of a, um, a degenerative process, more common in our diabetics. And you can see a little bit of that out on the sides too. Mm -hmm. And then another comparison as far as common things. On the right, this is a syndesmophyte. It's vertically oriented. It's very thin, bridging the corners of vertebrae together, right? As opposed to these horizontally are oriented. These are just straight up traditional osteophytes, right? Regular old bone spurs from degenerative change. They're along this, the lines of stress. So these spikes this way, that's just osteoarthritis of the spine. MRI wise, we have a lot of folks who get MRIs of different things too. Um, similar to how you can pick up inflammation in the bone marrow and MRI of the pelvis, on the spine you can sometimes see these changes too. These are called shiny corners. So bone marrow edema right in that corner where that syndesmophyte's trying to start to form. Um, we don't always kind of get this full screening right off the bat, but if you see this, it can be a, sh a sign of uh, evolving ankylosis at that location. 
Let me see. Here's some more psoriatic arthritis stuff here, a little pencil and cup kind of stuff going on in the deformity that happens there. Just wanted to show another picture of that, the asymmetry of it. And here is some nice pictures of some um, erosions too, right? Juxta articular, so like right next to the, um, the joint. Because that's the spot where like the cartilage covers here and right at the edge of the joint, the cartilage isn't covering. So if the synovium is inflamed, it can dig into there earlier than it can in the middle part of the joint. So definitely some inflammatory changes here. As opposed to this, so this is a little bit different. This is actually erosive osteoarthritis. So just to, the classic finding in erosive osteoarthritis are central erosion. So rather than this being a point, right, like a pencil and cup, see how it's eroding away in the middle? That's actually something osteoarthritis can do. So this pattern that we call this the seagull sign of this, this M like, McDonald arches M kind of thing there. That is a classic osteoarthritis sign. As you can see, it can be pretty aggressive and pretty destructive. So this is like somebody with like really big knobby bony nodule knuckles on physical exam. And certainly this can lead to a lot of disability too. This is a Z deformity of the thumb, also a classic osteoarthritis change.